right? So for the last couple Sundays, we've been camped at Sinai with the Israelites, and it was at Sinai where God enters into a covenant with his people. He had offered a covenant in chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, and the conditional term used in chapter 19, verse 4, is if they will obey my voice. And that word obey, therefore, reveals to us the basic response that God expects from people is obedience. The basic response that God expects from any person is obedience. However, with a heart that is disposed to be anti God and hostile to God, the human will will not submit in obedience to God. And so what we tend to do when we do obey is we think of it in terms of mechanistic or even pagan terms where there's a quid pro quo relationship between my obedience and the expected response of the deity. If I do X, Y, and Z or A, B, and C, then God fulfills his end of the deal and that's our transactional approach. But what we see in Scripture is that the only obedience that counts as obedience is obedience that flows from love. Love is the fundamental disposition and orientation that must inform our entire relationship to God. Otherwise, our obedience is in vain as Jesus explains to the religious leaders of his day. Which is why the Torah goes on to explain the relation, right relationship of people to God in terms of love. But specifically in the New Testament, we see Jesus affirm that principle when he's asked in Matthew, when he's asked in Mark, and again in Luke, what the greatest commandment is. In all of the Old Testament, what is the great commandment? And we all know his answer. We see his answer, for example, in Matthew 22 or Mark 12, where Jesus says, the greatest commandment is this, you shall what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. But he doesn't stop there. He offers up an, an unrequested, an unsolicited follow-up. The unsolicited follow-up is, and the second is like it. And what is that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus himself, therefore, orients our understanding of the right response to God and the orientation that, that informs our obedience as being one of love. And Jesus says even regarding himself, if you love me, you obey me. Obedience is expected but the obedience that is expected flows from a love, a desire, and a disposition, and an adoration of God. So, when we read the Ten Commandments, understand that these are rules. These are moral rules that God has imposed on the created order. But as we have been trying to say for the last two weeks, we cannot just simply write them on a clipboard and go through life thinking, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. At best, that will put us in the position of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. I've kept the commandments. Well, you lack one thing. And remember Jesus' response? It was then to get not just to the to the letter of the law, but to get to the heart, disposition, and affection, what was really gripping his life. And it was not God. So our attempts at keeping the law can never be construed as if I do this, therefore, I will be right in God's eyes. Or if I do this, I have a leg to stand on in expecting God to do something for me. Rather, we do this to imitate God. Be holy as I am holy. You shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We do the law to reflect God's holiness to the world. 
to magnify his name, to make it clear, just like a lighthouse at the coast, to make it clear that there is a safe way. The law, therefore, is to enable us to live missionally, to make God known. And so God's commands then are set within the context of a redeemed people. He mentioned it first in chapter 19, verse 4, that you have seen with your own eyes what I did to Egypt. And now he repeats it here in Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2, that I have delivered you. They are saved, therefore. And so what we're going to look at today is commonly known as the first table of the law. Due to the division of the Ten Commandments between the duties owed principally to God and the duties owed principally to our fellow man, even Jesus acknowledges that twofold division by referencing loving God and loving neighbor. But always remember, you can't properly love neighbor and keep the second table of the law unless you are loving God because who commanded the second table? God. So we can't totally divorce them as if, oh, I'm loving my neighbor, but, you know, or, or I'm going to love God and, and, and hate my neighbor. No, the Apostle John tells us in 1 John that we can't hate our neighbor and say we love God. They go together. But we're going to look at them separately because otherwise we would never get through today. Okay? So... The fundamental thrust, then, of the first table of the law is, in, in regards to God revealing himself to the people, that they are to make him their passion. God is to be the, the fundamental focus and orientating fact, orienting factor in their life. And what's interesting is if you read the Shema, from Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A fourfold. There's not saying there's four different parts to people. It's a way of saying that with your whole person, with all of your energies, focus on glorifying God and making him known to a watching world. And what's interesting is in these first four commandments, you kind of see that focus and emphasis where the first commandment focuses on, on the absolute God-centeredness of their life. And the second commandment focuses on the way they construe and understand and worship God. And the third commandment focuses on the way they represent God. And the fourth commandment focuses on the way they acknowledge God's sovereignty over their lives and circumstances and their trust for him to meet them in their daily needs. An absolute God-centeredness to all of life is what this is calling for. So let's look at these. Now, like I said, I have a friend who preached five sermons on each of the Ten Commandments. There's a, there's a lot that goes into it. And I remember when I was a chaplain, I, I had someone from a sister denomination of ours accuse me of violating the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Because as a military chaplain, I was using my ministerial office to promote the First Amendment, which gives people the right to have a God other than the Lord. So God tells you, Ben, you shall have no other gods before me, and the U.S. Constitution says you can have whatever God you want, and you're using your ministerial office to support people's right to do just that, to live in violation of the First Commandment. So Ben, you're in violation of the First Commandment. Wow. So th there's a lot of issues that we could dive into, but we're not going to do that. I'm not going to defend, but what I do want to do is show how the first commandment focuses on the, the absolute orientation of our life. When God says in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me, he is not saying there are a bunch of gods and you're not allowed to have one higher on the totem pole than myself. He's not saying that. 
You can have whichever gods you want, just make sure I'm the most important. That's not what he's saying. When it's before me, the phrase means before my face. You shall not have any other gods in my presence. And where is God's presence? With and among his people. He's saying you, will have, you shall have no other gods. I am one of many who find it interesting that God never says here, there are no other gods, so worship only me. Did you note way back several weeks ago when we were going through Moses' battles with Pharaoh, that never once does God say, these gods of yours are non-things, they're not gods, quit worshiping them and instead worshiping me. Did you note that he never says that they are not things? He simply battles them and defeats them. It isn't until later when God explicitly will say there are no other gods. I am the only true God. Here, God simply says you will have no other gods. And I think that's God speaking to the heart of humanity right there. Because it may be true, and it is true, that objectively speaking, there are no other deities. There isn't a, a pantheon of gods who battle for control and, and, and the world just sort of hangs in the balance, okay? There are no other deities. But functionally, there's a lot of gods, aren't there? I mean, we had, we had a, a gentleman from India just last week tell us that in, in Hindu pantheon, there's 33 million deities. And that's just in Hinduism. We have idols and gods that we worship all the time. Things that we make important and things that inform and our decisions and drive our passions and affections. And God is not here saying all these things are not gods. God is saying, you will have none of that in my presence. If you want to be in my presence, I must be your exclusive focus. Because gods are things that we look to to meet our deepest needs. Things that we trust in in order to keep chaos and disorder and darkness at bay. None of that. I exclusively will be your God. And we can easily say, oh, I don't have any other gods. The Lord is my God. Really? Well, there are two tests that you can give. There's the test of love. What is your passion? What gets you really excited? When you're stressed and you want to go to your happy place, where does your mind take you? Where does your heart take you? What really gets your juices flowing? What are you always willing to talk about at the drop of a hat? It's easy when a, when a young man or a young woman is in love and they're engaged perhaps even, you don't have to tell them to share about their fiancé. You can't hardly shut them up. But how many of us, we have to drag, be, talk about God only if someone drags it out of us. Things of heaven are he hardly ever to be found in our discourse. And we wonder why God seems so absent. It's not that he's far from us. It's that he's not our passion. But God says the whole focus and orientation of your life should be devoid of allegiance or love for these other things. Love me. Value and treasure me above all else. And the rest will follow. So there's the test of love. But there's always also the test of trust. What do you count on to help you when times are tough? When times are tough, to which God do you turn? Do you trust the latest medical science advancements to save you? Do you trust the learnings of social scientists to help your family be better? 
Incidentally, I just read a really good article that, m- that many of the studies done in the middle half of the 20th century were completely false. And people have been basing their lives on it, and they were utter fabrications. Do you trust your bank account? What do you trust? Your ability to get a job? What do you trust? Evaluate your own life by what you adore and what you're trusting, and there you'll see what you're really worshiping. That's the God who has preeminence in your life. And the Lord is saying, I have delivered you, therefore make me your sole obsession. The second commandment wants us to love God with our mind. Now, you may not think that that's what it's saying because it's talking about not making or bowing down to idols. But hear me out. The first commandment has already prohibited any other god. So, so obviously, if, if there's no other gods, then of course idols, of, idols which represent those gods are, are forbidden anyway by the first commandment. Okay? So if, if all false gods are prohibited by the first commandment, then what, what does it mean prohibiting idols in the second commandment? Well, in chapter 32... Israel's going to start itself on a pattern that repeats itself multiple times throughout its history to its own demise. And that is, it makes a golden calf. It likens the god they want to worship to the god, one of the gods of Egypt, because that's what they're familiar with, a culturally informed expression of deity. And they call it Yahweh. What God does not want us to do is to either be a part of the production or use of any visible representation of himself. Because what happens invariably is humans love saying visible representations of God are aids to worship. But what always happens is what we get is a culturally informed expression that reinforces whatever notions we have, and those notions are always two-dimensional at best. We see this throughout the history of the church, where people have construed of God, construed of Christ, in decidedly cultural terms. You see it in this own day. Well, in the earliest church, they, they understood no images. But then as, as the pagan world was increasingly converted, they made Jesus and they just reused statues of Apollo because Apollo was the fairest of the gods. It is absurd to think that Paul would have gone to Athens with his absolute frustration with all the idols And that he would have said, look, look, you have all these idols to all these gods. Don't worship those. It's absurd to think that he would open up his bag and pull out a statue of Jesus and say, this is the God you should worship. No idols. Because when a craftsman forms it, he's putting his values, his interests, his priorities. Did you know? That the image of Jesus that you see was cre- most famously was created in the Middle Ages to look like one of the Carolingian kings, Charles Martel and his descendants, because they wanted a Jesus in the Middle Age that reminded them of the kingship and glory. And then, of course, throughout the Middle Ages, he became ascended, and all the artwork depicts him as this terrible judge who must be placated. But then by the time of the revivalist, he's now presented as this doe-eyed, effeminate thing. And now every culture wants their own depiction of Jesus. Black Jesus, Mexican Jesus, Asian Jesus. We create Jesus or construe Jesus or God in our own terms, and that's what God wants us to avoid. Because when you do so, you have invested it with your values, 
and your priorities. And those always, always have a way, a funny way of being self-serving. God is a mighty roaring fire. And he's hard to contain. Impossible to contain. You want proof? Look at the rest of the second commandment. It's hard to, in, it's, it's, how do you put this in a box? Because right here, he says he visits the iniquity of the fathers. On the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. And so what we've tended to say is, uh, uh, what, what, must, what that must mean is that there are social implications. And so it's just the natural occurrence of a lesson that, you know, a father sets a bad example and that gets, per, and that gets propagated throughout generations. But it says the Lord visits it. And then we look at Ezekiel chapter 18, which says the soul that sins will die. How do we put this together? And so the common response is just to, to isolate one from the other without recognizing that God is a ferocious fire, a consuming fire. And it is true in Scripture that there are many examples to God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. And it didn't matter what Josiah the king did. His father Manasseh was so egregious that the text explicitly states God's anger was so great at what Manasseh did that nothing that transpired during Josiah's reign would turn his wrath away. When a culture, when a person gets a false notion of God, it is perpetuated generationally very often. And notice how it says those who hate him. Because hatred of God tends to be found in generational cycles. And love of God tends to be found in generational cycles. And the point here is that God stands ready to vindicate his name, but he's even more ready to lavish grace and mercy upon people who attempt to call on his name in truth. God cannot be construed in absolute terms by an image, and it's dangerous to try to do so. King Jeroboam finds this out in 1 Kings chapter 12. His big egregious sin, the sin that's so huge, I mean, it, it makes us scratch our head. We, when we hear that the northern kings were, were evil, we, we sometimes think that it was almost like they were these vicious uh, rulers who just murdered people in the streets and that it was just this, this horrid place when actually military and politically and economically things were great but the grave sin that they did was he made a golden calf and called it Yahweh and he put one at the southern border of his kingdom and one at the northern border of his kingdom so that the people would not have to go to Jerusalem because he knew that where the people's heart is there their feet would eventually follow. And he didn't want his people leaving the country to worship. So he made an image of God. And that's the grave sin of Israel that all subsequent generations of Israel kings are condemned for perpetuating. Be careful how you construe God. It happens so often. How many generations of Christians have grown up hearing nothing but the wrath of God against sin and deviltry and, and, and grace as a foreign concept? And then they react and then they construe of God only in terms of love. God would never judge me. God would never judge somebody. Really? We so often go off course construing God in ways that are amenable to our values while not being faithful to how God reveals himself and remembering that it is God who is free. So in your mind, let your understanding of who God is and how God works be shaped by Scripture, not your imagination, not your ruminations, not your culture, not even your church tradition but by the word of God and follow your tradition 
and accept your ruminations when it conforms to the teaching of Scripture. But third, God is concerned about the way he is represented. The third commandment, you, will, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, we have, I grew up thinking what this meant was don't, don't cuss. And if you're going to cuss, don't say the Lord's name when you're doing it. Okay? And, and absolutely, we shouldn't do that. And this propensity nowadays to, to, just, to just exclaim, God, God. I'm sure you've heard that. It's in movies. It's, in, it's, it, it's, it's all over the place. God. He's holy. You don't take something holy and, and be flippant about it. It doesn't say you can't use the name of the Lord. So the, so the Hebrews were wrong to, to not pronounce Yahweh. But it does say don't misuse But doesn't that say something about the way we often represent God in our speech and our behavior? How often, man, I, in the chaplaincy especially where I had, I had a lot of interaction with people from a charismatic tradition, every other person would come and tell me what the Lord told them to do or what the Lord told someone else that they should do. And it's like one person came and, and one week the, the Lord had told the pastor to tell someone that this person should be involved in the youth ministry. It, it wasn't working out two weeks later, so uh, the Lord told me that you should step down. Or at Moody Bible Institute, it was rampant. People would be going out, and usually it was the guy who would do this. You know, the, the Lord's laid it on my heart that we should break up. And, and, and do, you, do you see how manipulative that is? As soon as the Lord's name is invoked, well, then who am I to resist the Lord? No, the Lord didn't tell you. You told you. Don't use the name of the Lord to buttress your own decisions to baptize them with an air of a significance and authority. And certainly don't invoke the name of the Lord to deceive or defraud or to take advantage. Absolutely. But the fundamental thing here is how God is represented to the world. When it says right here, you shall not take the name take the Hebrew word is nasa okay and that word means to carry or to bear you shall not bear the name you shall not carry the name and what's interesting is in all discussions of the third commandment we focus on speech but interestingly nasa never other than supposedly here never refers to speech it's never used in reference to what one says it's used in reference to what one does. And Scripture repeatedly says that we are God's people called by his name. That's something that's true in both the Old and New Testament. If you're a Christian, you are called by his name. You bear his name. It's like going to a Braves game. and You put on the shirt. You put on the hat. And you're bearing the brave's identity. You're identifying yourself as being part of and associated with the team. But in our world, we'll identify ourselves with Christ. And so often the way we behave and the way we speak is we're taking God's name in a vain way. Famously, people with the little fishies on the back of their car, right? And what do they do? They, you know, they cut you off. My, my wife and I were just coming home on Monday or Tuesday from, from Costco, and, and we were getting on, we were turning off of Barrett Parkway onto I-75 North. We were right, right there at that light. And the go straight lane was a, was a Porsche. So he did what a Porsche can do when his competition's a minivan. So as soon as the light turned green, he just zoom, zipped out in front. It didn't, it didn't interfere with me at all. He was so fast. But he was in the go straight lane. And what was on the back of his Porsche? Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't soil a Porsche with any sticker. But a little fishy. <laughs> 
And that's a small thing. But we all get aggravated by it. When someone who is publicly professing acts like a jerk. But the thing is, is that unless you are not being a faithful witness at all and keeping your allegiance to Christ under wraps, which you shouldn't be doing, then people around you know that you are on Jesus' team. And how are you witnessing about him? How are you representing him to the world in what you say and in what you do? Are you faithfully bearing, carrying his name? Or is God's name mocked among the Gentiles because of us? God is passionate that he is center in our lives and that we understand and construe and allow his word to inform our understanding of him and that our witness of him be faithful. But then he's also passionate that we should model to the world trust in him in the midst of our circumstances, which is what the fourth commandment is. It's interesting here, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. In Exodus 20, right here, the rationale for the fourth commandment is creation. God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, therefore the Sabbath is holy. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, which is the repetition of the Ten Commandments, the, the, the grounding or the reason for the fourth commandment is different. The reason given there is you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord has set you free. Therefore, keep the Sabbath holy. So in both creation and in deliverance, God has asserted his right to order our time and our lives accordingly. We may be tempted to think because of Colossians 2, don't let anyone judge you in regards to a feast or a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, that, oh, this means we, this is absolutely abrogated. It's not. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. But the Sabbath was all about stopping. Sabbath became, came to mean rest. But initially, and at its root, it means stop. So Sabbath, Sabbathing means stopping. And initially, it was not really a day of worship. It became a day of worship. Worship was ongoing. Ta sacrifices happened every day. Every day. 365. Morning and evening. Sabbathing was they stopped what they were doing and they hunkered down in place. It wasn't until the era of the synagogue where the Sabbath became a day of corporate worship. And that model is what flowed into the Christian era. But initially the Sabbath was hunker down in place and stop what you're doing. They were an agrarian society. You know what happens every spring with winter wheat and, and, and fall with summer wheat? You've got to harvest it. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I've known farmers, and I know that stuff on the plant won't stay long. When it's time to harvest, you've got to pick it. But what does God say here? Stop. It is a profound statement of trust that the Lord will be and do everything that you need to literally stop working and striving after everything that you do to make your life normal and better and trust God to be and do that for you. That's a profound statement of trust. It's an opportunity that God has given us to stop all the stuff we concern our lives with and instead focus on what he has done for us to refresh ourselves in him. So when Jesus reminds the Pharisees that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, it would be an absolute butchering of Scripture, especially in the light of Isaiah 58, to think that Jesus is saying, Sab the Sabbath was made for you to just go out and do what you want, have a great time, see ya. The Sabbath was made for man because it is man who needs to rest from their labors and reorient and recenter and refocus themselves on God. 
God is unchanging and eternal. He doesn't need to refocus himself. We do. But also the reordering of time. Man, time marches on. I bet for most of you, your week, your month, your years, they look like a blur. And especially, I, I, I mean, I know for people in like military command, when they're in a position of command, it is a non-stop thing and it's 16, 18 hours a day. It is, it is a huge responsibility, and every day it just bleeds into another. When I was deployed, there was no such thing as a day off. Every day felt like Wednesday. There was never the sensation of, ugh, coming back to work like on a Monday. There was never the sensation of, woohoo, it's the weekend, like on a Friday. It, every day was the middle of the week. It was a blur. But one day in seven, God has given you to stop and break the monotony and refresh and restart the cycle. And that is God saying, I am sovereign over your lives and over your time and over your energy output. So trusting God and loving him with all of our might looks principally like making him first and foremost in our lives, by construing of him and worshiping him rightly, by witnessing and bearing testimony about him faithfully, and acknowledging his sovereignty over the circumstances of our lives. Now, there are a great many law codes in the ancient world, and they have great similarity with what we're going to look at next week, the second table. But what God says here in the first table is really unique amongst all the law codes of the ancient world. That's because there is one true God. And there is one Lord who has saved us. So let's pursue him. Let's love him even as he has loved us to the point of giving his son for us. And delight yourself in him. And he will be and do everything that you need this day until forever. Let's pray. Word of God speak.